some of you may know, some of you may not know, that our denomination, the United Methodist Church, is in a time of uncertainty and division, mostly related to issues of human sexuality. To try to find a way forward, our bishops have appointed a commission called the Way Forward Commission. Now, I am not going to go into all the issues right now. Um, I will let you know that the United Methodist Church has 12 million members. Uh, we are a global denomination with churches in Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, here in the United States, and the divisions are deep. And so this commission has been put together to try to discuss these issues in a different way and see if there's not some solution that can help us go forward in unity. The commission is made up of individuals, both lay and clergy, from throughout the denomination. They represent a wide range of geography. They represent a wide range of theological viewpoints. You might be interested to know that this uh, commission, the Way Forward Commission, is being facilitated by Ken Carter. Some of you know him. Uh, his wife, Pam, actually comes out of this church. And uh, Ken and Pam attended this church back, when, uh, back before they were famous, you know. Uh, Ken Carter is now the bishop of one of our largest conferences. And uh, I understand he may be about to be elected president of our Council of Bishops. And he is one of the facilitators for this Way Forward Commission. We have been asked, brothers and sisters, this week to pray for the Way Forward Commission. And that's what this red insert is about. As your senior pastor, I am asking you to take this with you and use it all week long. And each day, pray the prayer that is printed there. It's been written by somebody in our annual conference. And I would invite you to pray the prayer not just once, but several times throughout the day. We're going to start with the prayer that has been written by our bishop, Bishop Paul Leland. And you'll see the words there under Sunday, February 19th. And I will pray aloud on behalf of all of us, and if you will read along in silence. Let's pray together. You are our life, O Lord. Receive our prayers. Offered not only in words, but also in spirit, by which we come asking, seeking, and knocking for our heart's desires. Grant comfort to all who hope in you. We give you thanks for the gift of your church and for the mystery of your love in each other. Lord of the harvest, send out laborers into the harvest that we, like the early church, may minister in this beautifully diverse world as you consecrate our efforts to make new disciples of Jesus Christ. Guide the hearts of those who have been selected and appointed at this time to exercise discernment on behalf of the church. Grant them knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. A spirit of counsel and strength, that their delight be the fear of the Lord. May your light direct our prayers, conversations, actions, and decisions so that we may be more closely drawn to Jesus, your Son, our Savior, the light of the world. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Blessed Consoler, Comforter, and Teacher, help us to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus rather than being distracted by the storms that surround us, for we know He is with us in every tempest. Keep us faithful in all we do, especially in our work for unity, that we might be one in the faith of Christ, and let all God's people say, Amen. If you want to find out more about the Way Forward Commission or the issues they are dealing with, you can visit the United Methodist website. The address is easy to remember. It's umc.org. You can visit our annual conference website, Western North Carolina Conference of the United Methodist Church. Just do a search on that. You'll find it. Now, 
Please put that away for now. Take that, put it away, and take out your Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 5. You'll find it on page 5 in our New Testament. I am getting over a sinus infection, so I may have to sip from time to time. I beg your forgiveness or your indulgence. Turn to Matthew chapter 5 and do me a big, big, big favor. When I finish reading this scripture, please don't close your Bible. Keep it open. Keep it open because I want to come back and, and look at some of these verses carefully and closely. Now, before I read, think about somebody who you might consider an enemy. Now, I don't, I don't mean, uh, you, you know, an international enemy like ISIS or the Germans or the Japanese. I want you to think of somebody in your life who, frankly, irritates you, makes you miserable. I mean, it, it, this might be something as serious as a person who abuses you. It might be, you know, a coworker who's jockeying to get your job and is trying to make you look bad. It, it might be a family member that you just can't seem to get along with. It might be a a neighbor, you know, who's the neighborhood grump. Um, Think of a person that, if you're honest, you might think of as an enemy. Picture that person in your mind right now. Think about why they make you angry. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 38. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. But if anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. And if anyone wants to sue you and take your coat, give your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go also the second mile. Give to everyone who begs from you. And do not refuse anyone who wants to borrow from you. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. The Word of God for the people of God. Please keep your Bible open and let's pray. Oh God, this is a difficult message that you have placed before us. And so by the power of your Holy Spirit, open our ears to hear, open our minds to understand, and open our hearts to receive your word. And let all who agree say, Amen. So, I'm going to ask you a question. I want you to answer me out loud. What color are flamingos? Pink. Now see, that's a common misconception. Flamingos are actually white. It's true. They are born white as snow, and it's the shrimp that they eat that turns them pink. If you have flamingos in captivity and you don't feed them shrimp, they turn white. That's a common misconception that flamingos are pink. Let me tell you another common misconception. Listen carefully, I am stating a misconception. Here we go. You know, when you get right down to it, Jesus taught the same thing that other religions teach. Jesus taught the same things that most systems of morality teach. Be nice, be kind, be fair, don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal. Why? The teachings of Jesus are just common sense. 
That's the misconception. Now let me tell you the truth. The teachings of Jesus are not common sense. Turn the other cheek. Co common sense says defend yourself. Give to whoever asks from you. Common sense says hold on to what you got. Love your enemy. Common sense says get back at your enemy. The teachings of Jesus are not common sense. What they are is uncommon sense. Uncommon sense. It was a typical night in New York City, and Julio Diaz, a social worker, was on his way home. He was riding the subway home, and all he wanted to do was what he did every single evening, stop at his favorite diner and grab a bite to eat before he went home. Now, what was stopping him was a mugger. As soon as he got off the subway platform, a young man ran up to him, brandished a knife, and said, give me your money. And Julio Diaz realized it wasn't worth a fight, so he got his wallet out and gave it to him. As the young man turned to run off, Julio Diaz shouted after him, hey, wait a minute. If you're going to be robbing people all night, you're going to be cold. Here, take my coat. And the young man was so shocked that he actually stopped. And he took the coat. And then Julio Diaz said, You know, I was on my way to get supper. Would you like to come? I'll buy you dinner. And so they went to Julio Diaz's favorite diner, and they sat there, and they ate. And while they ate, all the waiters and waitresses and cooks and folks in the diner would, would come up to Julio and uh, say hello, pat him on the back, uh, greet him, and... The young man, the robber, said, Do you own this place? And Julio Diaz said, No, of course I don't own this place. It's just that I come here often, and, and, and we here, we, we treat each other with love. Didn't anybody ever tell you, young man, that you should love other people? And, and the young man said, Well, yeah, people told me that, but I didn't think anybody actually did it. Well, they finished dinner, and the, the check came. And Julio looked across the table and said, I really would like to buy you dinner, but um, you have my wallet. And so the young man gave Julio his wallet back. He paid for dinner, gave the young man $20, and then he said to the young man, give me the knife. You don't need to be robbing people. Now, what this social worker did goes against all common sense. It was not right. It was not safe. It was not fair. But are those things really more valuable than the opportunity to change a young man's life? Common sense? No. It's uncommon sense. October the 2nd, 2006. Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, Amish country. Charles Roberts, a milkman, walks into an Amish schoolhouse, a one-room schoolhouse. He orders the teachers and the boys out, and then he lines up the little Amish girls against the blackboard, and he shoots them. Five of them died. The other five were critically wounded, and then he shoots himself. Now, besides the horror that he brought to the Amish community, he left behind three children and a wife and his parents. And they were devastated by what he did. And they had to bear the shame of what he did. Charles Roberts' parents, Chuck and Terry Roberts, were so ashamed and so afraid of the wrath of the community that they actually went into their house and hung sheets on their windows to try to hide from the world. They were afraid. They were afraid that <clears throat> the Amish would come to them raining down all kinds of anger and hatred. And as a matter of fact, the Amish did come. An Amish man knocked on the door and came in their house. And he hugged them. And he wept with them. 
And he said, we have forgiven your son. And we want you to stay in this community. You are our neighbors and we love you. In the days ahead, when they buried Charles Roberts, the killer, over half the mourners who showed up were Amish. The Amish brought food to the Roberts, uh, the parents and the wife and the children. The Amish surrounded them with love and care and prayers. Later, when people started sending money in memory of the, the girls who were killed, the Amish decided to give half of it to the family of the killer, the family of the man who killed their children. Now, what the Amish did in choosing to forgive the man who killed their daughters and then care for his family, what they did goes against what most people think is right. It's not common sense. It's uncommon sense. So most of you probably know that last month Dylan Roof, the shooter in the uh, AME, uh, Emmanuel AME Church shootings a couple summers ago, Dylan Roof recently went through his trial, was found guilty, sentenced to death. I will never, ever forget what I saw in the news right after that shooting occurred They brought Dylan Roof into the court for his bond hearing, and the judge, before setting bond, asked, are there any family members who want to speak? And the first family member who stood up to speak, the the daughter of a woman who was killed, looked at Dylan Roof, and the first thing she said, I forgive you. You have taken something precious from me. I will never hold her again, but I forgive you. Now, listen, Dylan Roof still had to face trial. He still had to deal with the criminal justice system. We're not talking about doing away with criminal justice, okay? We're not, we're not talking about letting killers go free. We're talking about heart forgiveness. We're talking about spiritual forgiveness. And, and, and the forgiveness that the victims offered him, it, it didn't save him. It saved them from living the rest of their lives tormented by bitterness and anger. Common sense? No. It's uncommon sense. Now, earlier I asked you to think about an enemy. Could you bring that person back for me? Picture that person in your mind. Think about why they're making you angry. And you know what I'm going to say, don't you? (laughs) You already know what I'm going to say. Matthew 5, verse 43. If you got your Bible, look at it with me. Picture that enemy in your mind and hear the words of Jesus. You have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies. And pray for those who persecute you. Can I invite you to bow your head and picture in your mind the face of that person? And we're going to pray this together out loud. Together, out loud. Picture that person and then say this. God, help me to love this person. Amen. Now why? Why? Why should you love your enemies? Why does Jesus want us to love our enemies? It does not make sense. Well, actually, when you discover the why, when you look at this from God's point of view, it makes more sense than anything you've ever heard. Look at verse 45. Verse 45. So Jesus has said, love your enemies. And then verse 45, here's why. So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. In other words, God loves unconditionally. God loves unconditionally. That's what God does. 
And Jesus says, if you want to be called a son or a daughter of God, you're going to love unconditionally. Jesus says, I want you to grow spiritually to the point that you can love other people without condition. It, 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 listen, those girls who were up here earlier and they sang, you're a good, good father, it's who you are, okay? They nailed it. God loves us because of who he is. Not because of what we do. It's because of who he is. He's a good, good father. That's who you are. That's who he is. God loves people not based on what they do, but based on who he is. And Jesus says, if you want to be God's relatives, you'll love people not based on what they do, but on who they are. Excuse me, I'm sorry, who you are. Jesus calls us to grow spiritually through spiritual practices like prayer and Bible study and worship and serving. Jesus calls us to grow spiritually to the point that we can love the way God does unconditionally. Verse 46. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? Jesus says, look, if you're nice to the people who are nice to you, big deal! Anybody can do that. That's just common sense. And Jesus says, I want you to go beyond common sense. I want you to love the people who don't love you. I want you to be kind to the people who treat you like dirt. Because that's what God does. <clears throat> and then we get to verse 48, which seems to make no sense at all. Verse 48. Jesus says, be... What's that word? Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, common sense tells you nobody's perfect. In fact, the Bible even tells you nobody's perfect. We have all missed the mark. So why in the world is Jesus saying, be perfect? Well, it might help to know that the original Greek word that is translated perfect is teleos. Teleos. It's where we get the word teleological Telios and telios means perfected, completed, um, mature. It, telios is used of a piece of fruit when it's ripe and ready to eat. Telios is used of a student who has completed his or her studies and is fully trained. Teleos is used in 1 Corinthians 13. Later in the service, we're going to sing 1 Corinthians 13. That's the famous love chapter. Love is patient, love is kind. And, and, and teleos, the Greek word, is used when Paul talks about love and he, he calls love that which is perfect, that which is teleos, that which is complete, mature. And so what Jesus is saying to us is not, I want you to be perfect in the sense of being flawless. I want you to be perfect in the sense of unconditional love. You see, God's love is perfect because it extends to everyone. Jesus says, I want you to grow spiritually to the point where you can have that kind of love for others where you can be so full of the love of God that you don't have to take revenge, so full of the love of God that you can give to whoever asks, so full of the love of God that you want to do even more than what is required. Jesus says to be like this, to love in this way, is to be teleos, complete, mature. And so here's a truth that we need to understand in the church. Listen. Spiritual maturity is not how much you know. It's how well you love. 
Spiritual maturity is not how much you know. It's how well you love. Spiritual maturity is not how much you know. I mean, you can quote Bible verses. You can recite the kings of Israel. Uh, uh, you can explain the differences between Calvin and Wesley and all this stuff. It's, that's, it, spiritual maturity is not how much you know. It's how well you love. In fact, if you look at that verse, Matthew 5, 48, where he says, be perfect, and you compare it to its equivalent verse in Luke 6, there the word that's used is merciful. Jesus says, be merciful as your Father is merciful. <clears throat> to be merciful, to have that kind of mercy and unconditional love and grace and forgiveness is to be teleos, mature, complete. Spiritual maturity is not how much you know. It's how well you love. Spiritual maturity is not how much you know, it's how well you... Now listen, I know that many of you want to grow spiritually. You want to be spiritually mature. Here's the thing, it may be, it may be, that if you really want to grow spiritually, you don't need to go to another Bible study. And you don't need to listen to another sermon. And you don't need to read another book. It may be that if you really want to grow spiritually what you need to do is walk out of here today and love an enemy. You say, I can't. I can't feel good about this person. I don't like this person. Well, that's not what love is. In the Bible, love is not a feeling. It's a choice and an action. So how do I love my enemy? I will that person's good, and I do what's good for that person. So if you really want to grow spiritually, maybe the best thing for you to do today is walk out of here and love an enemy. Do good. Do something good for somebody you don't like. Do something kind for somebody who is unkind to you. Show unconditional goodwill to somebody who makes your life miserable. Now, is this common sense? No. It's uncommon sense. I'm going to invite you to bow your head, and we're going to pray a prayer together, or I'm going to pray a prayer. <clears throat> and this prayer is, was written by a Serbian bishop during World War II. This bishop spoke out against the Nazis, and the Nazis put him in Dachau concentration camp. While he was there, he wrote this prayer. Listen. Bless my enemies, O Lord. Even I bless them and do not curse them. Enemies have driven me into your embrace more than friends have. Friends have bound me to earth. Enemies have loosed me from earth and have demolished my aspirations in the world. Just as a hunted animal... <clears throat> find safer shelter than an unhunted animal does, so have I, persecuted by enemies, found the safest sanctuary, having ensconced myself beneath your tabernacle, where neither friends nor enemies can slay my soul. Bless my enemies, O Lord, even I bless and do not curse them. And let all God's people say, Amen.